Book 7 So speaking, Hector the Glorious swept on through the gates, and with him went Alexandros his brother, both of them minded in their hearts to do battle and take their part in the fighting. And as to men of the sea and their supplication, the god sends a fair wind when they are breaking their strength at the smooth oar sweeps, driving over the sea, and their arms are weak with weariness. So these two appeared to the Trojans, who had longed for them. Each killed his man, Paris, the son of Lord Arethus, Menestheos, who lived in Arn, born to him of the war club, Arethus, and to Oxide, Philomedusa, while Hector with a sharp spear struck Aeonius under the circle of the bronze helm in the neck and broke his limb's strength. And Glaucos, lord of the Lycian men, the son of Hippolochus, struck down with a spear Iphinus in the strong encounter. Dexius' son, as he leapt up behind his fast horses, striking him in the shoulder. He dropped from car to ground, and his limb's strength was broken. Now as the goddess gray-eyed Athene was aware of these two destroying the men of Argos in the strong encounter, she went down in a flash of speed from the peaks of Olympus to sacred Ilion, where Apollo stirred, stirred forth to meet her from his seat on Pergamos, where he planned that, that the Trojans should conquer. These two then encountered each other beside the oak tree, and speaking first, the son of Zeus, Lord Apollo, addressed her. What can be your desire this time, O daughter of great Zeus, that you came down from Olympus at the urge of your mighty spirit? To give the Danans victory in the battle, turning it back, since you have no pity at all for the Trojans who are dying. But if you might only do as I say, it would be far better. For this day, let us put an end to the hatred and the fighting now. They shall fight again hereafter, till we witness the finish they make of Ilion, since it is dear to the heart of you, who are goddess immortal, that this city shall be made desolate. Then in answer the goddess grey-eyed Athene spoke to him, Worker from afar, thus let it be. These were my thoughts also as I came down from Olympus among the Achaeans, Achaeans and Trojans. Tell me then, how are you minded to stop these men in their fighting? Now in turn the son of Zeus, Lord Apollo, addressed her, let us rouse up the strong heart of he- in Hector, breaker of horses, if he might call forth some Danan to battle against him, single man against single man, in bitter combat. And let the strong grieved Achaean, stirred into admiration, send forth a single man to do battle with brilliant Hector. He spoke, nor failed to persuade the goddess grey-eyed Athene. Now Helenus, Priam's beloved son, gathered into his heart their deliberation and all that pleased the amusing divinities. He went on his way and stood beside Hector and spoke a word to him. Hector, O son of Priam and equal of Zeus in counsel, would you now be persuaded by me, for I am your brother? Make the rest of the Trojans sit down, and all the Achaeans, and yourself call forth one of the Achaeans, their bravest, to fight man to man against you in bitter combat, since it is not your destiny yet to die and encounter fate. For thus I heard in the speech of the gods everlasting. So he spoke. And Hector, hearing his words, was happy, and went into the space between and forced back the Trojan battalions, holding his spear by the middle until they were all seated, while Agamemnon in turn seated the strong grieved Achaeans, and Athene and the lord of the silver bow Apollo, assuming the likeness of birds of vultures, settled aloft the great oak tree of their father, Zeus of the Aegis, taking their ease and watching these men whose ranks, dense settled, shuddered into a bristle of spears, of shields, and of helmets as when the shudder of the west wind suddenly rises, scatters across the water, and the water darkens beneath it, so darkening were settled the ranks of Achaeans and Trojans in the plain. And now Hector spoke forth between them. Listen to me, you Trojans and strong, grieved Achaeans, while I speak forth what the heart within my breast urges. Zeus, son of Cronos, who sits on high, would not bring to fulfillment our oaths, but is found to be of evil intention toward both sides until that day when you storm Troy of the strong towers, or that day when you yourselves are broken beside your seafaring vessels. Seeing now that among you are the bravest of all the Achaeans, let one of you, whose heart stirs him to combat, combat against me, stand forth before all to fight by himself against brilliant Hector. Behold the terms that I make. Let Zeus be witness upon them. If with the thin edge of the bronze he takes my life, then let him strip my armor and carry it back to the hollow ships, but give my body to be taken home again, so the Trojans and the wives of the Trojans may give me in death my right of burning. But if I take his life, and Apollo grants me the glory, I will strip his armor and carry it to sacred Ilion, and hang it in front of the temple of far-striking Apollo. But his corpse I will give back among the strong benched vessels, so that the flowing haired Achaeans may give him due burial, and heap up a mound upon him beside the broad passage of Heli. And some day one of the men will come, men to come will say as he sees it, 
one who is in his bent ship sails on the wine blue water. This is the mound of a man who died long ago in battle, who was one of the bravest and glorious Hector killed him. So he will speak some day, and my glory will not be forgotten. So he spoke, and all of them stayed stricken in, in, to silence, in shame of refusing him, and in fear to take up his challenge. But now, at long last, Menelao stood forth and addressed them, in scorn and reproach, and stirred within the heart to grow sorrow, to great sorrow. Ah, me, you brave in words, you women, not men, of Achaia. This will be a defilement upon us, shame upon shame, piled, if no one of the Danans goes out to face Hector. No, may all of you turn to water and earth, all of you, who sit by yourselves with no life in you, utterly dishonored. I myself will arm against this man, while above us the threads of victory are held in the hands of the immortals. So he spoke, and began to put on his splendid armor. And there, O Menelaus, would have shown forth the end of your life under the hands of Hector, since he was far stronger than you were. Had not the kings of the Achaeans leapt up and caught you, and the son of Atreus himself, powerful Agamemnon, caught you by the right hand, and called you by name and spoke to you. Menelaus, beloved of God, you are mad. You have no need to take leave of your sense thus. Hold fast, though it hurts you, nor long in your pride to fight with a man who is better than you are, with Hector, Priam's son. There are others who shudder before him. Even Achilles in the fighting where men win glory trembles to meet this man, and he is far better than you are. Go back now and sit down in the throng of your own companions. The Achaeans will set up another to fight against this man, and even though he is without fear and can never be glutted with rough work, I think he'll be glad to leave off even if he comes off the hole from the hateful fighting and bitter combat. The hero spoke like this and bent the heart of his brother since he urged wisely, and Menelaus obeyed him, his henchmen joyfully thereupon took off the armor from his shoulders. Nestor, among the Argives now, stood forth and addressed him. Oh, for shame! Great sorrow settles in the land of Achaia. Surely he would go groan aloud, Peleus, the aged horseman, the great man of counsel among the Myrmidons, and their speaker. Once as he questioned me in his house, once as he questioned me in his house, he was filled with great joy as he heard the generation and blood of all the Argives. Now, if he were to hear how all cringe away before Hector, many a time he would lift up his very hands to the immortals, and the breath of life breath from his limbs would go down to the house of Hades. If only, O Father Zeus, Athene, Apollo, I were in my youth, as when the Pylians assembled and the spear-fighting Arcadians battled by swirling Celadon, by the streams of Iardanos, and before the ramparts of Phia, their champions stood forth, Erythalian, a man godlike, wearing upon his shoulders the armor of Lord Arethus, Arethros the brilliant, given by the men of that time and the fair girdled women the name club fighter, because he went into battle armed neither with the bow nor the long spear, <laughs> but with a great bar clubbed of iron broke the battalions. Lycorgos killed this man by craft, not strength, for he met him in the narrow pass of the way where the iron club served not to parry destruction, for Lycorgos too quick with a stab beneath it, pinned him through the middle with a spear, so he went down backward to the ground. And he stripped the armor brazen Ares had given him, and wore the armor thereafter himself, through the grind of battle. But when Lycorgos was grown an old man in the halls, he gave it to his beloved henchman, Erythalian, to carry. Wearing this armor, he called forth all the bravest to fight him, but they were all afraid and trembling. None had the courage, only I, for my hard enduring heart and its daring drove me to fight him. I in age was the youngest of all of them, and I fought with him, and Pallas Athene gave me the glory. Of all the men I have killed, this was the tallest and strongest, for he sprawled in his great bulk this way and that. If only I were young now, as then, and the strength still steady within me, Hector the glancing helm would soon find his battle. But you, now, who are the bravest of all Achaeans, are not minded by the good will to go against Hector. So the old man scolded them, and nine and all stood forth. Far the first to rise up was the lord of men, Agamemnon, and rose after him the sons of Tydeus, strong Diomedes. And next the two Aeantes rose, their fierce strength upon them. And after these, Idomeneus, and Idomeneus' companion, Meriones, a match for the murderous lord of battles. And after these, Eurypolis, the glorious son of Iamon, and Thoas rose up, Adriamon's son, and brilliant Odysseus. All of these were willing to fight against brilliant Hector. And before them again spoke the Geranian horseman Nestor. Let the lot be shaken for all of you to see who wins it. 
He shall be the one to gladden the strong grieved Achaeans, and to be glad within his own heart if he can come off whole again from the hateful battle and bitter combat. So he spoke, and each of them marked a lot as his own lot. They threw them into the helmet of Atreus' son, Agamemnon, and the people, holding up their hands to the gods, prayed to them. Then would murmur any man, gazing in the wide sky, Father Zeus, let Aes win the lot, or else Diomedes, Tydeus' son, or the king himself of golden Mycenae. So they spoke, and Nestor the Dranian horsemen shook the lots, and a lot leapt from the helmet, that one, that one they had all wished for, the lot of Aeus. And a herald carrying it all through the great throng showed it from left to right to the great men of the Chians, all of them. Each man knew not the mark and denied it. But as carrying it all through the great throng, he showed it to that one who had marked it as his, and thrown it in the helmet, glorious Aeus. He held forth his hand, and the herald stood by him, and put the lot in it. And he saw his mark on the lot, and he knew it, and his heart was gladdened. He threw it down on the ground beside his foot and spoke to them. See, friends, the lot is mine, and I myself am made happy in my heart, since I think I can win over brilliant Hector. Do this, then, while I put on my armor of fighting. All of you be praying to the Lord Zeus, the son of Cronos, in silence to, and each to himself. Let none of the Trojans hear you, or openly out loud, since we have nothing to be afraid of at all since no man by force will beat me backward unwilling as he wills, nor by craft either, since I think that the man who was born and raised in Salamis, myself, is not such a novice. So he spoke, and prayed to the Lord Zeus, the son of Cronos, and then would murmur any man gazing in the wide sky, Father Zeus, watch over us from Ida, most high, most honored, grant that Aeus win the vaunt of renown and the victory, but if truly you love Hector and are careful for him, give to both of them equal strength and make equal their honor. So they spoke, and meanwhile Aeus armed him in shining bronze. Then when he had girt his body in all its armor, he strode on his way, and Ares the war god's war god walks gigantic going into as Ares the war god walks gigantic going into the fighting of men whom the son of Cronos has driven to fight angrily in heart perishing hatred. Such was Aeus as he strode gigantic. The wall of the Achaeans smiling under his threatening brow, and his feet beneath him taking huge strides forward and shaking the spear far shadowing. And the Argives looking upon him were made glad, while the Trojans were taken every man in the knees with trembling and terror. And for Hector himself, the heart beat hard in his breast, but he could not any more find means to take fight, flight and shrink back into the throng of his men, since he in his pride had called him to battle. Now Aeus came near him, carrying like a wall his shield of bronze and sevenfold ox hide, which Tychios wrought him with much toil. Tychios, at home and highly far the best of all workers in leather, who had made him the great gleaming shield of sevenfold ox hide from strong bowls and hammered an eightfold of bronze upon it. Telamonian Aeus, carrying this to cover his chest, <coughs> came near to Hector and spoke to him in the words of Menes. <coughs> <clears throat> Hector, single man against single man, you will learn now, for sure, what the bravest men are like among the Danans. Even after Achille Achilles Even after Achilles the Lionhearted, who breaks men in battle, he lies now apart among his own big seafaring ships in anger at Agamemnon, the shepherd of the people. But here we are, and we are such men as can stand up against you. There are plenty of us, so now begin your fight and your combat. Tall Hector of the glancing helm answered him. Aias, son of Telamon, seed of Zeus, O lord of the people, do not be testing me as if I were some ineffectual boy or a woman who knows nothing of the works of warfare. I know well myself how to fight and kill men in battle. I know how to turn to the right, how to turn to the left, the ox hide tanned into a shield, which is my protection in battle. I know how to storm my way through into the struggle of flying horses. I know how to tread my measures on the grim floor of the war god. Yet great as you are, I would not strike you by stealth, watching for my chance, but openly, so if perhaps I might hit you. So he spoke, and balanced a spear far shadowed, and threw it, and struck the sevenfold ox hide terrible shield of Aias in the tear up <coughs> in the uttermost bronze, 
which was the eighth layer upon it. And the unwearying bronze spearhead shore in its way through six folds, but was stopped in the seventh oxide. Then after him, Aias, the illustrious, in turn, cast with a spear, far shadowing, and struck the shield of Priam's son on its perfect circle. All the way through the glittering shield went the heavy spearhead, and crashed its way through the intricately worked corselet. Straight ahead by the flank, the spearhead shore through this, his tunic, yet he bent away to one side and avoided the dark death. Both, now gripping in their hands the long spears, pulled them out and went at each other like lions who live on raw meat, or wild boars whose strength is no light thing. The son of Priam stabbed then with his spear into the shield center, nor did the bronze point break its way through, but the spear had bent back. Now Aias, plunging upon him, thrust at the shield, and the spear had passed clean through, and pounded Hector back in his fury, and tore at his neck passing so that the dark blood broke. Yet even so, Hector of the shining helmet did not stop fighting, but gave back in the heavy hand caught up a stone that lay in the plain, black and rugged and huge. With this he struck the sevenfold oxide terrible shield of Aias in the knob of the center so that the bronze clashed loud about it. After him, Aias in turn, lifting a stone far greater, whirled it and threw, leaning into the cast his strength beyond measure, and the shield broke inward under the stroke of the rock like a millstone. And Hector's very knees gave, so that he sprawled backward, shield beaten upon him. But at once Apollo lifted him upright, and now they would have been stabbing with their swords at close quarters, had not the heralds, the messengers of Zeus and of Bortles, come up, one for the bronze-armored Achaeans, and one for the Trojans, Ideos and Tathabios, both men of good counsel. They held their stays between the two men, and the herald Ideos, out of his knowledge of prudent advices, spoke a word to them. Stop the fight, dear children, nor go on with this battle. To Zeus, who gathers the clouds, both of you are beloved. And both of you are fighters. This thing all of us know surely. Night darkens now. It is a good thing to give way to the night time. I asked, the son of Telamon, spoke to him in, the, in answer. Bid Hector answer this. Ideo, since it was he who in his pride called forth all our bravest to fight him, let him speak first, and I for my part shall do as he urges. Tall Hector of the glancing helm answered him. I ask, seeing that God has given you strength, stature, and wisdom also, and with a spear you surpass the other Achaeans, let us now give over the fighting and hostility for today. We shall fight again until the divinity chooses between us and gives victory to one or the other. Night darkens now. It is a good thing to give way to the night time. Thus you may bring joy to all the Achaeans beside their ships, and above all to those who are your own kindred and company. And I and the great city of Lord Priam will gladden the Trojans and the women of Troy with their trailing robes who will go before the divine assembly in thanksgiving for my sake. Come then, let us give each other glorious presents. So that any of the Achaeans or Trojans may say of us, these two fought each other in heart-consuming hate, then join with each other in close friendship before they were parted. So he spoke, and bringing his sword with nails of silver, gave it to him, together with the sheath and the well-cut sword belt. And Aias gave a war belt, colored, shining with purple. So separating, Aias went among the Achaean people, and Hector went back among the thronging Trojans, who were made happy when they saw him coming alive and unwounded out of the combat, escaping the strength and the unconquerable hands of Aias. And they, who had hoped to see him alive, who had not hoped to see him alive, escorted him back to the town. On the other side, the strong, grieved Achaeans led Aias, Aias, happy in his victory, to great Agamemnon. When these two had come to the shelter of the sons of Atreus, Agamemnon, the lord of men, dedicated an ox among them, a five-year-old male, to Zeus, all-powerful son of Kronos. They skinned the victim and put it in order and butchered the carcass and cut up the meat expertly into small pieces and spitted them and roasted all carefully and took off the pieces. Then, after they had finished the work and got the feast ready, they feasted, nor was any man's hunger denied a fair portion. And Atreus' son, the hero wide-ruling Agamemnon, gave to Aias in honor the long cuts of the chine's portion. But when they had put away their desire for eating and drinking, the aged man began to weave his counsel before them first. Nestor, whose advice had shown best before this, he in kind intention toward all stood forth and addressed them. Son of Atreus, and you other great men of all the Achaeans, seeing that many flowing here to Achaeans have died here, whose dark blood has been scattered beside the fair waters of Scamandros by the fierce war god, while their souls went down to the house of Hades. Therefore, with the dawn, we should set a pause to the fighting of Achaeans, and assembling them wheel back the bodies with mules and oxen. 
then we must burn them a little apart from the ships, so that each whose duty it is may carry the bones back to a man's children when we go home to the land of our fathers. And let us gather and pile one single mound on the corpse pyre indiscriminately from the plain and build fast upon it toward ramparts to be a defense of ourselves and our vessels. And let us build into these walls gates strongly fitted that there may be a way through them for the driving horses. And on the outer side and close, we must dig a deep ditch circling so as to keep off their people and horses. That way we may not be crushed under the attack of these proud Trojans. So he spoke and all the kings gave him their approval. Now there was an assembly of Trojans high in the city of Ilium, fiercely shaken to tumult before the doors of Priam. And among these, Antenor, the thoughtful, began to address them. Trojans and Dardanians and companions in arms, hear me while I speak forth what the heart within my breast urges. Come then, let us give back Helen of Argos and all her possessions to the sons of Atreus to take away. Seeing now we fight with one true, with our true pledges made into lies, and I see no good things accomplishment for us in the end unless we do this. He spoke thus and sat down again, and among them rose up brilliant Alexandros, the lord of lovely-haired Helen, who spoke to him in answer and addressed them in winged words. Antenor, these things that you argue please me no longer. Your mind knows how to contrive a saying better than this one. But if in all seriousness this is your true argument, then it is the very gods who ruin the brain within you. I will speak out before the Trojans, breakers of horses. I refuse, straight out. I will not give back the woman. But of possessions I carried away to our house from Argos, I am willing to give all back, and to add to these for my own goods. <laughs> he spoke thus, and sat down again, and among them rose up Priam, son of Dardanos, equal of the gods in council, who in kind intention toward all stood forth and addressed them. Trojans and Dardanians and companions in arms, Hear me while I speak forth what the heart within my breast urges. Take now your supper about the city, as you did before this, and remember your duty of the watch, and be each man wakeful. And at dawn, let Idaeus go to the hollow ships and speak with the sons of Atreus, Menelaus, and Agamemnon, giving the word of Alexandros, for whose sake this strife has arisen, and to add this solid message, and ask them if they are willing to stop the sorrowful fighting until we can burn the bodies of our dead. We shall fight again until the divinity chooses between us and gives victory to one or the other. So he spoke, and they listened to him with care and obeyed him, and so took their supper, watch succeeding watch, through the army. Then at dawn, Adeos, Adeios went down to the hollow ships, where he found the Danans, henchmen of the war god, in assembly beside the stern of Agamemnon's ship. The herald with the great voice took his stand in their midst and spoke to them. Son of Atreus, and you other great men of all Achaeans, Priam and the rest of the haughty Trojans have bidden me to give you, if this message be found to your pleasure and liking, the word of Alexandros, for whose sake this strife has arisen. All his possessions that Alexandros carried in his hollow ships to Troy, and I wish that he had perished before then, he is willing to give all back, and to add to these from his own goods. But the very wedded wife of glorious Menelaus, he says that he will not give, though the Trojans would have him do it. They told me to give you this message also, if you are willing, to stop the sorrowful fighting until we can burn the bodies of our dead. We shall fight again afterward until the divinity chooses between us and gives victory to one or the other. So he spoke, and all of them stayed quiet in silence. But now at long last, Diomedes of the great war cry addressed him. Now, let none accept the possessions of Alexandros, nor take back Helen, one who is very simple can see it, that by this time the terms of death hang over the Trojans. So he spoke, and all the sons of the Achaeans shouted a claim for the word of Diomedes, breaker of horses. And now powerful Agamemnon spoke to Idaeus. Idaeus, you hear for yourself the word of the Achaeans, how they are answering you, and such is my pleasure also. But about the burning of the dead bodies, I do not begrudge you. No, for there is no sparing time for the bodies of the perish, once they have died, to give them swiftly the pity of burning. Let Zeus, high thundering lord of Hera, witness our pledges. He spoke, and held the scepter in the sight of all the gods. Then Idaeus made his way back to the once more, <clears throat> once more to sacred Ilion. The Trojans and Dardanians were in session of assembly, all gathered in one place, awaiting Idaeus when he might come back. And he returned to them and delivered his message, standing there in their midst. 
and they made their swift preparations for two things, some to gather the bodies and the others firewood. While the Argives on the other side from the strong bench vessels went forward, some to gather the bodies and others firewood. Now the sun of the new day struck on the plowlands, rising out of the quiet water, and the deep stream of the ocean to the climb the sky. The Trojans assembled together. They found it hard to recognize each individual dead man, but with water they washed away the blood that was on them, and as they wept warm tears, they lifted them into the wagons. But great Priam would not let them cry out, and in silence they piled the bodies upon the pyre with their hearts in sorrow, and burned them upon the fire and went back to sacred Ilion. In the same way, on the other side, the strong, grieved Achaeans piled their own slain upon the pyre <clears throat> with their hearts in sorrow and burned them upon the fire and went back to their hollow vessels. But when the dawn was not yet, but still the pallor of night's edge of a, cho a chosen body of the Achaeans formed by the pyre, and they gathered together and piled one single mound all above it indiscriminately from the plain and built a fort on it with towered ramparts to be a defense for themselves and their vessels. And they built within these walls gates strongly fitted, that there might be a way through them for the driving of horses. And on the outer side and against it they dug a deep ditch, making it great and wide, and fixed the sharp stakes inside it. So the flowing haired Achaeans labored, and meanwhile the gods in session at the side of Zeus, who handles the lightning watches, watched the huge endeavor of the bronze-armored Achaeans. And the god Poseidon, who shakes the earth beneath, began speaking among them, Father Zeus, is there any mortal left on the wide earth who will still declare to the immortals his mind and his purpose? Do you not see how now these flowing haired Achaeans have built a wall landward of their ships and driven about it a ditch and not given to the gods any grand sacrifice? Now the fame of this will last as long as dawnlight dawn light is scattered, and men will forget the wall, that wall which I and Phobios Apollo built with our hand, hard work for the hero Laomedon city. Deeply troubled, Zeus, who gathers the clouds, answered him, What a thing to have said, earth shaker of the wide strength. Some other one of the gods might fear such a thought, one who is a god far weaker of his hands and in anger than you are. But the fame you shall last but the fame of you shall last as long as dawn, dawn light is scattered. Come then. After once more the flowing haired Achaeans are gone back with their ships to the beloved land of their, their fathers, break their wall to pieces and scatter it into the salt sea, and pile again the beach deep under the sands and cover it, so let the great wall of the Achaeans go down to destruction. As these two were talking thus together, the sun went down, and the work of Achaeans was finished. They slaughtered oxen then beside their shelters <laughs> and took their supper. The ships came over to them from Lemnos, bringing them wine. Ships sent them over, over to them in numbers by the son of Jason, Euanos, whom Hippisippal had borne to the shepherd of the people, Jason. Apart to the sons of Atreus, Agamemnon and Menelaos, Jason's son had given wine as gift a thousand measures, and thence the rest of the flowing here to Keans bought wine, some for bronze and others for shining iron, some for skins and some for the whole oxen, while others paid slaves taken in war, and they made their feasting abundant. All night long thereafter the flowing here to Keans feasted, and the Trojans and their companions in arms in the city. But all night long Zeus of the councils was threatening evil upon them in the terrible thunderstroke. Green fear to cold them. They spilled the wine on the ground from their cups, and none was so hardy as to drink till he had poured to the all-powerful son of Kronos. They lay down thereafter and took the blessing of slumber.